All right, we are going to get going here. We have a lot of great content, so I want to make sure we get through it and also have a little bit of time for some live Q&A at the end. So first off, thanks again for joining us on today's webinar, COVID-19 Billing and Coding Updates in FAQs. Uh, you do, if you are attending this live right now, uh, you do get one AAPC CEU for attending it live. And so we'll make sure to send that out to you through email following today's webinar. Uh, as usual, everybody is on mute, but if you do have questions for us uh, for the end of the presentation, you can submit those through the Q&A panel. We have quite a few attendees today, and so please submit those to the Q&A panel and not the chat panel if there are questions related to the topic discussed today, as that will keep us organized to make sure that we do get to your question or at least see it. If we don't get to it, uh, we do answer all questions following and make sure to send that report out as well. Uh, with that said, uh, today's presenter is Ardeth Campbell, and she is one of the content and regulatory wizards on our team at Vitalware. Officially, she is the content product manager here at Vitalware. Vitalware and Ardeth, I'll hand it over to you. All right. Thanks, everybody, for taking time out of your day to attend the call. And I just kind of wanted to get some stuff together just to give you some updates and go over some of the frequently asked questions that come in. Um, first off is our basic uh, disclaimer statement. This is um, just an update, and it's current as of today. Um, we're not exactly sure what uh, will go on tomorrow, but as of today, this is the info that we have and that it's good. So our, our basic uh, agenda is we'll cover some of the new um, ICD-10 PCS codes that came out. Uh, yeah, published July 31st that they were effective August 1st. Thank you very much. Um, and we have some new CPT codes. Um, and then we'll touch on the evaluation and management uh, versus the originating site fee for facilities. That's one that we get a lot of questions on. Um, and so then we'll go over some other items and other frequently asked questions that come in. Um, and then I also wanted to talk about some of the proposed rule topics um, that are resulting from uh, the COVID-19 waivers and flexibilities that were published in the uh, outpatient prospective payment system rule and also the Medicare physician fee schedule proposed rule. And I, um, and not that the, I don't have any bullet points on this, but um, I will also add some details that I heard when I was listening to a webinar that was provided by the AMA um, this last Tuesday. So um, kind of going off the deep end here, we've got a, a, a new jack scalpel, uh, a new, uh, so it's a new piece of equipment there, haha, -ha. um, but it does kind of tie into some of those new PCS codes. And CMS is, has said that, you know, the, uh, you've, the facilities are already doing these procedures. They wanted to give you specific procedure codes so that you could, uh, so that you can bill for these items. Um, now, one I, item I do want to talk about is the remdesivir. It has been given uh, kind of a, an emergency use approval through the FDA, uh, but only on an inpatient basis. So if you are um, giving patients the remdesivir um, that can be charged, there is no HICS-PICS code for the drug. So you can, um, you know, on the inpatient claim, it would just be charged underneath the revenue code. Um, but if you did need a Hicks picks, just use one of the um, the not otherwise specified. Um, but it usually gets taken off on the back end before it goes out the door. So these are for um, the introduction uh, percutaneous approach, and then we've got um, like through the central vein. Uh, percutaneous. So it's a lot of the same drugs, uh, just different approaches and different technology groups. Uh, the ones, though, that I did want to touch base on are the bottom two on this slide, the XW13325 and the 14325. That is for your transfusion of your convalescent plasma. Pl convalescent plasma. Um, once the peripheral vein, the other is the central vein. And um, during the last CMS office hours 
call, uh, it was questioned, you know, what, uh, what P code would you use or, you know, what would you use for the plasma itself? And uh, CMS said right now the convalescent plasma is only used on the inpatient side, so it would not be used, uh, so there would no, not be a Hicks picks. So they do not have a Hicks picks for this. For this, um, however, the uh, the person with the question did say, but eventually we may be doing this on an outpatient basis. And how would we, uh, you know, how would we report it then? Um, and so they're taking that into consideration. So it's possible that in a future time there would be a, a P code specific for convalescent pl plasma. Um, right now, they're just expecting it to be reported with the uh, the revenue code. Um, and there is also the miscellaneous uh, P code that can be used or the unlisted P code. Um, but right now, it has the status indicator in the E's, which means that for CMS anyways, they would deny it. So there are still some uncertainties in some of this coding and how it will translate from the inpatient basis to the outpatient basis if it indeed goes to be approved for outpatient use. Um, also, uh, effective August 10th, um, there were some new uh, CPT codes that were published by the uh, American Medical Association or the AMA. Um, the 0225U does state that it has 21 targets and that each analyte reported um, as detected or non detect or not detected so for that each one will need to be documented um, whether it was detected or not to be able to report that code and then um, they have some other neutralizing antibody um, procedure codes and then I also wanted to put in here the ones that were effective June 25, um, just so that you were aware that, yes, these were available and they are out there. I was looking at the AMA website yesterday and their next CPT editorial panel meeting is, um, I believe, October 10th. And so uh, there is a possibility that new codes could be published by then. Um, so we'll, you know, send out a vital alert as we, uh, as we see any updates on those. All right. Um, and then I just wanted to uh, use this as, as an example, the 0202U and the one that I read before. This one also has 22 targets. Um, and the, the proprietary laboratory analysis codes do represent specific uh, manufacturers. Um, and I did have the uh, question come in, okay, so what if we use this test, but we're only testing for the one target? Then um, in that instance, you're not able to use this uh, procedure code because the description states each pathogen, pathogen reported as detected or, non de, or not detected. And you're not able to use a modifier like modifier 52, which means reduced services, because the CPT guidelines state that to uh, report the PLA code, you have to perform, at, you must fulfill the code descriptor and, uh, and, be list, and represent that uh, manufacturer. So they're, they're pretty specific on that. So if you're doing one of these tests but not checking all of the targets, then you're not able to report this CPT code under the PLA um, guidelines, but you can, you can find another lab code that should be able to pinpoint the one target that you are checking for. So that's just kind of a caution that I wanted to go over today. All right, and um, I also wanted to touch base on an, the update to a MedLearn Matters article, the SE20015, the 20% MSDRG adjustment. So starting September 1st, to have a claim be eligible for the 20% increase in the MSDRG, uh, you're going to have 
the facilities are going to have to have a positive COVID-19 laboratory test documented in the patient's medical record. So you have to have the results of the test, um, and it can be any, you know, any of the viral tests performed within 14 days of the admission. Um, and it can, you can use uh, tests that are performed, like if, it's been, if the lab test was done in the doctor's office or at another entity, you can use those. Um, and so they're just expecting that you're, able, you're going to be able to import those into your medical record. Unfortunately, it does not allow for those instances where the doctor's clinical documentation or clinical indications state that, yes, this patient has COVID-19. Um, you have to have a positive laboratory test. Um, and so if you have multiple, you know, the person keeps testing negative, um, that's still that is not going to fly. And a CMS has also said that, you know, if you're kind of functioning outside of that 14 day window, um, that you can contact them and, and they can make some allowances. Uh, and so what they're doing in the meantime is if you do not have, uh, so after uh, admissions after September 1st, if you do not have that laboratory test documenting the positive result, um, then you're supposed to contact the, your MAC and say, hey, this, this uh, claim is not going to be eligible for the 20% increase in the MSDRG. And it is not until the October 1st pricer information comes out and gets uploaded that the MAC is going to have anything uh, to be able to kind of adjudicate those properly. Uh, so you'll have, be sure to work with your Mac to find out when they have all of that information uploaded into their system so that they're able to process the claims correctly. Oh, alrighty. Um, so just, uh, it, you know, the 14 other, you know, if it's over the 14 days, um, you know, CMS said they would consider the other complex medical factors um, within that requirement. So um, it, it's going to be tricky to kind of keep tabs on some of those because the MAC is supposed to put an internal, um, like have an internal uh, flag that they can put on that claim so that it's not processed at the higher reimbursement. So that's kind of... Uh, interesting and always cause con for concern. All right, um, another topic I wanted to talk about is that the diagnosis code guidelines for the U07.1 is changing for the COVID-19. They are taking out the language for the pre presumptive positive being able to um, assign the U07.1. So just, um, you know, that and this should this will take effect October 1st. Um, the only confirmed cases can be documented as the U7 U07.1 for COVID 19. Um, and so they are noting that it is an exception to the inpatient the hospital inpatient guidelines um, regarding the confirmation. So uh, if you are if it's suspected or possible or probable, um, then use the signs and symptoms for code assignments. And it's a good plug for our ICD-10 uh, webinar that's coming up next month. Uh, so be sure to sign up for that as well. All right. And one of the, one of the, I wish I was asleep on my job some days <laughs> like that, but one of the questions that we get quite a bit is, can we bill the evaluation and management code like the G0463 or the originating site fee? And in the uh, Medicare fee-for-service uh, free FAQ document, they have now added a decision tree 
and so it really uh, it really helps. So, um, is is there a distant site practitioner who's billing for the services on the list of the telehealth services, and using that ninety five modifier, meaning that this is a true telehealth service. Now remember the distant site is where the provider is located. So if the physician is um, at home or um, really anywhere within the United States or the, um, our territories like the Guam and Puerto Rico, et cetera, uh, then they can do the telehealth site fee. And if that's the case, then you can bill the Q3014. So it's the physician is not in your facility, uh, so they're in their home, and they're using 90, the modifier 95, then the facility um, can use the Q3014 as that originating site facility fee. And that you know, is still dependent upon the patient's home being designated as a provider-based department. All right. So can the hospital service be furnished remotely to a patient in an off-campus provider-based department? Yes. Um, so when your hospital, the, your hospital staff is furnishing that remote hospital service, even if they're using those telecommunications technology, you can bill the care as if the care was furnished in the hospital. So that would be the, um, either the physicians in the hospital providing to the, um, the patient um, whose home has been designated a provider-based apartment, then you can bill the evaluation and management code, either like the G0463, um, or it could even be the emergency department visit. Um, so it's, um, and then also, if there is no uh, professional service being provided, the physician is not sending in a claim for that day, but it's a service that's being provided by um, your, like your nurse visit or your um, medical nutrition therapy, uh, like the, the pharmacist, if they're doing like a Coumadin clinic type thing, then you can still build, you can build those out um, on using the appropriate evaluation and management level or other appropriate CPT code, because um, I mentioned medical nutrition therapy and, and those do have their own uh, CPT codes that can be used. And then um, also if the patient's, um, if the patient's home has been designated as a provider-based apartment and you are sending staff to the patient's home, then you can bill that as if the care was furnished in the hospital um, because once the patient's home is designated as a provider-based apartment, then it is in effect an extension of the hospital. All right, so hopefully that gives you uh, some insight into that. So it's going to, really the big difference is, you know, where's the physician located? Are they in the facility or not in the facility? And um, if they're not in the facility, then the physician should be billing that with the 95 modifier. And so uh, that would be an instance where you would just bill for the Q3014. All right, so uh, what kind of providers or services? Um, and that, you know, I mentioned nutrition services and your nurse visits and your pharmacist. So um, that can also be the like behavioral health counseling, um, all kinds of, of things. But that's also assuming that the person is practicing according to your state scope of practice laws. So it's... Uh, but the intent is is to allow the providers to, uh, you know, do as what their scope of practice and their uh, what all of their learning has provided for them to be able to do uh, to be able to provide services to the patients. All right, sore knee, huh? Have you tried icing it? I I thought that was funny because then in my head. <laughs> You know, I hear the, the gingerbread man from Shrek going on. 
All right. So uh, where there can be some confusion is for your physical therapy, occupational therapy, and your speech language pathology providers. Um, this, I think CMS kind of muddied the waters a bit, and that is because they had to be creative in what they were doing to get around the laws that are in place. Uh, and so it's kind of, I would say crazy. Crazy is a good word. Um, so for professional services, if you're doing it during your audiovisual, um, those can be submitted on the 1500 using the modifier 95 and then the, the place of service where the therapist is uh, normally practices care. And this would be for therapists, um, for these providers that are in their, uh, have their own professional practice. Um, now on the facility side, um, this is going to be where it kind of takes a turn towards the loony bin because there's two ways that facilities can do this. Um, so the services for uh, the for PTOT and ST are mostly have been added to the list of uh, approved telehealth services, but not all of them. Um, and so you have to kind of determine, are we going to be doing these as telehealth or are we going to be doing these uh, where we make the patient's home a part of the, uh, you know, a, as a provider-based apartment. So, um, and this also kind of lets you get away from having to designate the patient's home as a provider-based apartment in a way. So if you are going to do them as telehealth, they have to be services furnished on the CMS telehealth list, and you would use modifier 95 on each telehealth service. And of course, the place of service is not necessary on the UB because there's no spot for it, um, which is different from the instructions for the professional claims. All right, you're also, when you're doing them as telehealth, you're not able to submit for the Q3014 telehealth originating site facility fee and in this instance, the patient's home would not necessarily have to be designated as a provider-based apartment. All right, so deep breath. Then uh, the option number two is going to be where you designate, where the patient's home is designated as a provider-based apartment. So in this instance, you're not limited to the services that are on the approved telehealth services list. And you do not use modifier 95, but you do use the modifier PN or PO. Um, and then there's no restriction regarding reporting Q3014 for the originating site fee. So if the patient's home is de designated as the as a provider-based apartment, you could, in theory, bill, you know, like your physical therapy services and the originating site fee. Um, in this option, you're not limited only to those services on the telehealth list. So you do have the ability to provide more services than what's listed on that list. And it's nuts and um, it's kind of, so it is kind of odd. So option one is to determine you're going to be doing this as telehealth. Uh, so they would have to be services on the telehealth list. You would use modifier 95. You're not able to submit for the Q3014 because um, the patient's home is not designated as a provider-based apartment. Option two, 
that is where the patient's home is designated as a provider-based apartment. You're not limited to the services on the telehealth list. You don't, so you don't need to use modifier 95, um, but you would use the non-accepted or accepted uh, PNPO modifiers. And in theory, you could use the Q3014. So um, to me, it's, it, um, it, it's a little odd in how they chose to go about this, um, but it is uh, due to regulations that are currently in place. And so there is, um, there is some quagmire, yeah. It's like getting stuck in quicksand and not being able to get out. Um, but they, CMS did uh, provide a decision tree um, within that FAQ document. And um, I'll make sure that it's in the slides, the link to it's in the slides. All right. So let's kind of deep breath, shake it off. Whew. All right. So for specimen collection charges, we've got the... Uh, G2023 and G2024, so that is for um, independent laboratories to use when they go around to the, the patient's house. Uh, we also have one for rural health clinics, the G0205. Um, and then um, the specimen collection charges. So if you're in a physician's office or the clinic, the CPT for the evaluation and management includes obtaining the specimen. So if there is no other office visit, then you can bill the 99211. Um, and of course, that can be for either new or established patients. They've kind of waived that for a bit. Now for the C9803, the hospital outpatient clinic visit uh, for the specimen collection, um, it can be reported with other services, but it's assigned to the Q4 uh, status indicator. So it's going to be packaged into um, any other service that has status indicator, the S, T, or V. So that's your surgical procedures, kind of your, the T is where you get the 50% uh, reduction when it's provided with another service. And then your, uh, your V, like your, your clinic visits. Um, so at first they did, CMS did come out and say, you know, hey, if there's other services, you don't report the C9803, um, but they kind of took a hint from all of the questions they were getting regarding it. And they did say, okay, you can, um, but it is, but they did assign it to that Q4 status indicator. So it will be packaged into other services. All right, now, that leads us into pre-admission testing. You can report the uh, specimen collection, but uh, for inpatient admissions, um, it's going to package into the DRG if it's in within your three-day or the one-day payment window, whichever one that um, you fall into on that. So for you know your 72 hours. Uh, pre-admission. Um, it does not apply to critical access hospitals. And then for your outpatient um, admission, um, CMS says go ahead and report it, but it is going to package if there's another the STV status indicator service on the same day, um, which we just covered on the previous slide. So, um, it, so long story short, uh, you can report that, uh, but depending on whatever you report it with is it's going to pack, it could package into the other services. All right, and I also wanted to touch base on pharmacists um, because this also was mentioned in the proposed rule that, um, you know, it's the, it isn't anything new um, that because they're, if the pharmacist is employed by the, by the hospital, they're considered ancillary or auxil auxiliary staff, uh, just like your nurses and uh, your other uh, medical nutrition therapy stuff, uh, folks. So um, it's as long as they're 
uh, practicing within your, you know, the state scope of practice regulations, any other state laws. Um, so within their their licensure, um, and it has to be incidental to a physician or non-physician practitioner's plan of care. Um, and so, and then also if those services are not reimbursed under a different payment system, uh, like your Part D dispensing, um, so if they're talking to the patient, you know, that quick consult at, for new prescriptions, you know, do you have any questions on the medication? Do you have any, um, you know, those types of things? And then if they're part of the opioid treatment program, those are different payment systems where those services might be reimbursed. And so for the service, it has to be under the appropriate level of supervision, um, mostly general. Um, and so... Uh, they can't, so that your pharmacist can also do things such as your specimen collections, um, like the 99211 E&M code for, um, oh, like for Coumadin clinics. Um, they can also do injections for flu injections, those types of things. Um, so, um, you know, just if you kind of think of them of, okay, what are they allowed to do under state law? And if they have the physician kind of directing their, their steps, then it is something that you're able to report. All right, and then the proposed rule topics. Um, and, and sometimes reading those proposed rules, I do procrastinate. <laughs> All right, so one of the topics that came up in the proposed rule was should C9803 be kept past the public health emergency um, because it's, you know, long after the pandemic is over, I'm sure we're going to be continuing to test for, uh, for COVID. Um, and it also is raising the possibility that the PHE will carry over into 2021. Um, some of the other topics that were raised was, um, you know, should they just extend the use? Uh, because the intent was to deactivate it after the public health emergency is over, um, or should they go ahead and make this permanent? Um, and then some of the other language was also um, to make, uh, uh, you know, just have it be effective through the end of the year in which the public health emergency ends. Um, so just kind of some of the wording there, and uh, I was in on the last CMS office hours, and just kind of some of the things that they were thinking is it leads me to believe that they may go ahead and extend the PHE one more time, which would take us into 2021. Um, and then if they continue to use, allow some of the flexibilities and waivers past the emergency that it would be through the end of 2021. Um, so that's just conjecture on my part. Um, and things can change between now and then. Um, and they are um, going to, they are proposing to make the, like the non-surgical extended duration therapeutic services, um, which are like your, it, usually your infusions, to make that general supervision for the entire service rather than um, being initiated, you know, the more, the doctor having to be there for the initiation of service. Um, and so your, any comments that you wanted to send in, they're due by October Fifth. All right, and then the Medicare physician fee schedule proposed rule was interesting, and I'm still trying to get through it. That's kind of the procrastination part. Um, but they wanted to create an additional category of telehealth services, but these are only for the professional side. This does not. Um, the provision of telehealth services beyond the public health emergency was not even discussed on the facility side. So um, it will be interesting to see how this 
continues. Um, and so they, um, but they are talking about changing direct supervision to permit the virtual, which is the audiovisual presence, um, to be used instead of having to have the doctor there in the in the office or office suite. Um, and then also to allow other um, the supervision of diagnostic procedures to allow additional uh, professionals to, to do those, such as your uh, your ARNPs, um, nurse midwives, those kind of those folks that are not yet able to do that. They're able to through the pandemic, but once that pan the pandemic ends, um, will that be continuing? So they're proposing to allow that and. They did mention more than the ARNPs, um, but I didn't want to get into too many nitty gritty details. Now for the teaching facilities, um, they are also proposing to continue the direct supervision by audiovisual presence and to um, continue to allow the residents to moonlight in the inpatient setting. Um, and so what was uh, interesting in the uh, webinar that the AMA did was they are also proposing to CMS to allow for the kind of the telemedicine services to continue and not be solely restricted. Uh, so once the pandemic is over, uh, you know, the telehealth goes back to only being, you know, the rural providers, um, but they're putting forward that they would like to be able to continue to do that, even to do telemedicine, even outside of the scope of rural areas, because this allows the, um, the physicians um, or the physician's office to be able to do the two-way audiovisual communications with their patients that may have difficulties getting into the office and to, um, you know, to be able to have those, uh, some, you know, visits for folks that maybe should not be out um, exposed to the general public for whatever health condition they may have. Excuse me, tickling my throat. Um, and so they would like to continue to have the telemedicine uh, because they're saying doing this is actually increasing uh, or improving patient outcomes because they're able to kind of keep tabs on their patients better and making sure they're sticking with their, um, you know, their medication routines and, and things. Um, and so uh, they were also discussing that they wanted to can have pay parity for those services, um, similar to what it would be for evaluation and management services or, or what have you, um, so that they're not losing any income. Uh, to me, it was interesting because there was no discussion of how that would be handled on the facility level. Uh, you know, it's great if the physician's in private practice, but if the um, if they're part of a facility system, you know, who's bearing the cost for the, um, you know, the audio video equipment, um, you know, if you're going through a specific um, provider for your, uh, for your telehealth services, you know, they, they charge you for that. Well, who's bearing the cost for that? Uh, you know, who's registering the patients, who's setting up the, uh, you know, the phone call, you know, the nurse's time, um, you know, all of that fun stuff. So there's still quite a bit that will uh, come about. And I, th I think it's great. Uh, you know, it's a, a wonderful way to be able to keep in touch with your patients who can uh, do that type of um, you know, where that type of service does be, is helpful, um, but also then it kind of, to me, leads me down the path of thinking, okay, but what about when you have, you know, your medical nutrition therapy, your registered dietitians, um, you know, your, your folks on the facility side that are not able to use the, uh, you know, the professional claim but the facility claim form for their services. And um, at this point, I didn't hear any discussion on that. So that will be something that you might want to keep an eye on um, or, or get in motion.
All right. So, Dusty, that was the end. Um, yeah. The end of the. <laughs> All right. So I've got yes. All right. So the. Um, I do have a link to the remdesivir emergency use authorization if you need to read it. The, um, the second one, those uh, frequently asked questions, that document is updated a lot by, the, um, by CMS. Uh, and so that does have the decision tree for the, um, for the G code versus the Q3014 code and the physical therapy, the PTOT SLP services. Um, and right now it's on page, the uh, G0463 versus the Q3014 is on page 126. But that may change, that will probably change. <laughs> okay, great. Well, um, it's great content. We already have a lot of questions that we'll try to get to as many as we can live. Um, but again, if you do have questions, you can submit those in the Q&A panel. We'll try to get through as many of those as possible. Uh, I'm talking fast for a reason, but uh, we will be sending out the slides. We had a few questions about that. You'll get the slides. You'll get a link to the recorded webinar so you can rewatch it. And we have a number of articles and previous webinars on a lot of these topics that we're getting questions on. Um, if you go to vitalware.com slash COVID-19, no hyphen, um, that's where all of our billing and coding resources are specific to COVID-19. Um, so you can check that out or just go to our resources section on our site and you'll find it there as well. Um, and we will we'll also be sending out for you attending live right now, you get a, a PC CEU and so you'll get notification on that as well. All right, let's dive into some questions here. If a patient receives remdesivir infusion while in the hospital, what type of procedure should be linked to that coded infusion? Can this only be charged on IP accounts or can it be charged on observation accounts as well? Well, the, um, for remdesivir, it's only supposed to be used when the patient's an inpatient and that does not include patients that are observation patients. Um, but I would need to double check the emergency use authorization. Uh, but at this point, uh, it's, but since the emergency use authorization only covers inpatient, you would only be able to use the um, the codes that were, sorry, I should have, let's see, there's two of them uh, because they've got, whether it's a peripheral vein or central vein, so they've got the XW033E5 And then uh, the XW043E5 for the central vein. Yeah, so somebody also asked, is there an administration or procedure code of some kind required when administering remdesivir, so. Yes, these, uh, yeah, no warning. <laughs> these came out the 31st saying you can use these August 1st. All right, uh, next question. Do you know which code would apply to the Abbott 15 minute test? Uh, for that one, I, I would have to research and get back to you so I can make sure that I, because I, I don't know that one specifically off the top of my head. Uh, so I can look that up and, and give you yep. the answer on that. Sounds good. Uh, how will CMS Max know about the positive COVID test within 14 days to apply the 20% increase in DRG reimbursement? Uh, well, that they are, if you're coding it with the U07.1, they are going to automatically give that 20% increase. And so that's why it, you're going to have to call them and say, hey, I don't have the positive the lab work, the positive test in the chart, um, and so we don't get the 20%. So, uh, yeah, they're, they're putting that in your hands. And for, the, for uh, after the pricer is effective October 1st, they said, uh, CMS said that they would provide additional guidance. Um, we just, we have not seen that yet. Um, and the inpatient final rule, we usually get in mid, 
mid-August has not been published yet either. Uh, so they're, they're running behind on things. Uh, someone mentioned they don't understand what you mean when you say PBD. Oh, sorry, that is provider-based department. Uh, so hospitals can charge for defined telehealth services in a patient's home provided they have submitted the home address to be designated as an outpatient department of the hospital. They're looking for confirmation Co there. Correct. Yes, okay. that is correct. Yes. Um, we have, a, um, well, there is a previous question in our COVID resources. Um, if you are a, um, if you are a subscriber of Vitalware, there is a, um, a vital alert that we've done that has the information on how to do that. Um, and it's also a question in my advisor. So you can find it several different ways. Yeah, we, we also public facing a great recent article on G0463 and Q3014 clarification. So check those out as well, as long, along with the modifiers with those. So, um, How do you designate a patient's home as provider-based? Okay, well, that's, um, it, you have 120 days from the date of service to be able to do that. And uh, basically it's sending a, a list uh, of addresses to your CMS regional office. Um, and so, uh, frankly, I don't know, and it's kind of funny because this came up in the CMS after hours call. It, it, somebody said, you know, well, what are they doing with these at the regional office? And, uh, you know, because, you know, those poor guys are probably getting inundated with um, addresses. And, and it was kind of the, you, you kind of got the impression that it was, they're really not doing anything with them. It, that was just a way to circumvent the laws that are in effect. So I know some of the regional offices are going through a few of them, uh, but I can guarantee they're probably not going through every one of them. Sure. Um, all right, this is when you were discussing, you had option one and option two, I think, around the telehealth services, but for PT, OT, and SP for option two, would you just bill the regular CPT codes for the services provided and not Q3014? Um, let's see, let me get to, here we go, option two. Um, so option two, um, you could bill the Q3014, uh, but you are getting the reimbursement, you know, your regular reimbursement for the services that you're providing um, and, you know, but you can still, you know, so if you are having a, an additional cost for, um, you know, the telehealth equipment, you can, you could use the Q3014. So uh, it's really just to help you get reimbursement for any costs that you're incurring uh, while providing the services. Right. Uh, so what ICD-10 ICD code would you use for pre-admit testing when a COVID test is performed, same encounter as procedure? Um, it, if they are experiencing, um, well, it's a pre-admit. Did you say it was pre-admit? Yeah. What do you use for pre-admit testing when a COVID um, test is performed the same on the same visit as procedure. Yeah. The same pre-admit diagnosis that you would use for other lab tests that you're doing at the same time. Uh, there hasn't been any specific guidance come out saying to use, uh, you know, any other specific code. Okay. Uh, another pre-admission pre pre-admission testing on outpatient procedures, not within the same day, pending negative COVID results. I didn't read that quite right, but okay, yeah, um, it, yeah, because what's what's happening is that um, when somebody's going in is going to have a a procedure done, they have to go 
like a week ahead of time to get the COVID test. Um, and so you would you could still use the same diagnosis that you would uh, for the pre-admit testing or if they're exhibiting signs and symptoms, uh, you could use those. Uh, and so those, since it's outside of the that payment window, then it is possible that those would be reimbursed separately. But a lot of that does depend on some of your payer contracts. CMS would pay it because it's not on the same, the same day, so it would not be packaged. Um, but for other payers that have a, a longer span, um, I know the last time I had surgery, uh, my pre-op stuff was a week ahead of time and they packaged it into the surgical procedure and didn't pay it separately. Uh, so kind of good segue, if, if COVID testing is done before surgeries and are done a week before the surgery, should the test go on the surgery facility claim or should it be on a separate claim? Um, it could be, it's dependent on what your, um, what your policy is now. So if you send those out, uh, you know, not on the surgical claim, um, you can send it out ahead of time. Okay, great. We probably have time for like two more questions and then we'll have to get going, unfortunately, but we will download all the questions and make sure that they get in the uh, FAQ report that we send out following the webinar. Uh, next question is, for critical access hospitals, does the 20% adjustment apply as CAHs are not reimbursed by DRGs? Um, unfortunately, no. The, um, and I would have to go back and look to see specific for critical access hospitals so that I don't misspeak. Um, but since you're not reimbursed under the MSDRG, then you would not get the 20% MSDRG increase. Uh, but I am having difficulty remembering what kind of increase you're getting. So I will double check that and make sure I, I let you know. All right, this will have to be the last question live anyway. Uh, can provider charge a &M if he is performing the collection of tests? Um, yes. So if the so if the physician is collecting the test, um, that could be charged with an E and M. Okay. Um, that's unfortunately all the time we have today to answer live. But um, we'll send the link with your CEU certificate. Uh, a link to where you can find and download the slides as well as rewatch the webinar on demand if you need to. Um, and then once Ardith works through um, the remaining questions in her team, we'll make sure to include those. And that will be at the same link as the recorded webinar and uh, the slides. I just, we, keep, we can't guarantee it'll happen at the same time because it takes a little bit longer to get through those and make sure we answer those with the well-researched answer. Um, again, we do have a, a COVID-specific billing and coding spot on our public-facing website for anybody that wants to, to go there. You'll go to vitalware.com slash COVID-19 or just go under the resources section of our site. You can find that there. Um, otherwise, another way, good way to stay in touch with the resources we're putting out is through our monthly newsletter called The Mid, and you can sign up for that at the footer of any page at vitalware.com as well. Thanks again for attending today. Uh, we do have a few more webinar webinars coming up in the next few weeks if you want to check those out and sign up. Otherwise, have a great rest of your day. Thanks, all. Awesome. Thank you, everybody.